Hi, uh, my name is Nipat. I'm from psychology department. Um, so I'm going to be on the perspective of teaching the last class of 120 people or 20 or 60 students. Hi, can you hear me? My name is Natalia Kuznetsova. I'm a um, PhD student in education and I'm a TA at World Language, Lingu Literature and Linguistics Department. I've been doing it for five years already. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm from the biology department and I've taught labs, lectures, pretty much every size class. So. Uh, I believe we are up for questions. So oh. any questions that you guys have? Yeah. Uh, so if you couldn't hear how much of what we teach is lecture versus one-on-one um, -on -one or student engagement is kind of what you're going for. So for me, it kind of depends on the class. Um, for a lab, I'd really prefer not to use that. I'll yell. Um, small room. For a lab, um, I'll talk for like five, ten minutes max and then let them go in a lecture-based class. Um, I'm a little abnormal for most of my colleagues, but I'll, I'll talk for five minutes, give them an activity to do something for a while, talk for five more minutes, um, and most of what I do is one-on-one -on -one with the students while they're doing, uh, while they're doing group work or project-based project -based things. So. Okay. Well, in foreign languages, it's really all about interaction and engagement. You start your class in a foreign language, and you just go on with that. So there is no lecturing at all. And you actually lecture during office hours when students come to you with questions, and you start explaining them in, <coughs> in English how the language works. But usually in the classroom, it's communicative approach, and you're just teaching your target language. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, we have a teaching supervisor. so. We have um, meeting, uh, uh, weekly meetings uh, that all uh, graduates uh, teaching assistants will be together and talk about our issue in class. And also our slide has been, uh, slides has been prepared for. So um, pretty much we have to really read the textbook because we advise the student to read the textbook as in syllabus. So we read them and we make sure that we uh, cover everything that is needed for the exam and for the slides. Yeah, so for the most part, it's probably going to depend on <clears throat> what your discipline is and who your supervisor is. So um, most of the first year classes that are being taught, um, you'll, have, uh, you'll have a supervisor that gives you lessons or gives you PowerPoints or at least a little bit of guidance where um, you can kind of just take that and do what they tell you to do. It's pretty straightforward right off the bat. Um, if you're nervous, that's fine. Everyone is. I find the more nervous I get, the more I have the students do. Um, <laughs> so if I'm nervous, if I don't know what to say or what to talk about, give the students something to talk about and let them go. Um, and if you stand there in silence, they'll eventually start talking. So. I think if, uh, all, if you want to let the student do your act, the activities, you have to be prepared. Like you have to plan for the class in advance. It's not yeah. like because you don't have anything to say, so you let them do something. It has to be really well planned. Kind of one hour that you have, or 50 minutes that you have, you have to really uh, kind of suggest them that you are ready for the class and not just like, oh, I don't know anything, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't mean to give the impression that you shouldn't prepare. <laughs> yeah, not at all. Um, yeah, um, in terms of my psych, uh, the psych psychology class, especially like Site 101 uh, introductory class, you know that you are going to be uh, teaching the same thing with 20, uh, 23 more other more students, uh, other more graduate students. So you have to be in the same pattern and every uh, class structure has to be the same because you, know, you are a part of uh, 3,000 students that is in your class. So, anything to add? So, are there any many world language folks here? But with foreign languages, it's different. Like, um, you're assigned a syllabus, you just have to follow the syllabus, but you're responsible for all the activities and time management in class. So, you structure your own lesson, but of course, you have to be very, very prepared because 50 minutes is not enough. Time 
goes very fast, it flies. So if you spend one more minute on one activity, not um, organizing your students, because they can take your time easily. They just always, they always talk, especially in French foreign language class. So preparation is, I mean, 99% of your success in the classroom. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jamesa. Uh, a good number of GTAs around might be teaching for the first time, so I suppose. Might not be exposed to presentation of content and everything of that nature. Um, you talked about, and previous speakers talked about preparation and preparation of content, delivery approach, and everything of that nature, PowerPoint presentation of your content. How do you handle this challenge? Do you, do you handle it with your supervisor preparing content for every class you're going to teach? Or you just sit down and creatively think, I'm going to teach this, this particular topic. How do I creatively come up with activities how do I do this? So, so how do you handle this? Perhaps if you have not been teaching, you know, for those who are not who have not been teaching in the past for for, for the last many years. Thank you. Can you trust this? Oh, he doesn't need it. Um, so sometimes, and so it depends on who you're teaching for. So. Biology classes that I've taught are very different from the math, teaches, math classes that my wife teaches. Um, and if you're teaching an organized class that has multiple graduate students teaching um, the same class in different sections, then it's going to be fairly organized. If you're teaching your own class, it's probably going to be uh, more self-directed. So, um, so if you have a class where it's kind of like group teaching, like five, five, 15, 20 TAs are teaching the same class, um, then it's fairly directed. The person, somebody's going to give you a syllabus, somebody's probably going to give you um, maybe some lesson plans, maybe some things to work from. Um, if you're teaching your own class or, um, or like a math class or probably foreign language too, um, they're, they might give you a syllabus, they might give you an old syllabus that you're expected to make your own off of and design all the lessons on your own from that. Um, <clears throat> so the first one's easy to handle, you just do what you're told. Um, sometimes they'll run through it with you and say, this is kind of what we want you to do and that's easy. Um, and then you get in front of the class and just do what you were told and when you get nervous, just take a few seconds, breathe, and keep going. Um, when you're making, designing your own classes, your own lessons, um, you're, you've all been in school. You've all taken classes a long time. Um, it's difficult to be a good teacher, but it's easy to teach. Um, so when you're first starting out, I think the biggest thing is whether or not you're confident, fake it. Um, <laughs> I'm a huge introvert. I can talk in front of you guys, but when I get one-on-one -on -one with other people, I close off. But I can do this because I practice. Um, I can fake being confident. Um, so when you're designing your own lessons for the first time, when you're working on your own syllabus, um, draw from your own experiences. You've been in a lot of classes in the past, whether it's, uh, whether it's been undergrad, whether it's this country, whether it's another country, Whatever your experiences may be, use your own. Um, because humans all kind of learn in very similar ways, no matter what their background is. So, um, and they're going to learn something. And when you're starting out, keep your goals fairly limited. Just get through the lessons. And if students are struggling, they can come to you. Um, so you might be given a draft syllabus or something like that. Work from that a little bit. Make it your own. Make it however you're comfortable. When you're doing your lessons, come up with what do I want my overall goal to be and how do I think it would, I would get there and then try to design a lesson around that. But again, you've all been in classes so you all know what it looks like from the other side. So I, 
I'd just say work from your own experiences. Okay, so from my perspective, you're gonna get you're gonna get a uh, share Dropbox. So you get the whole Dropbox, the folder that said week one, this is chapter one, and these are the slides for for Shang of this week. So you have to get through three or four slides, set of slides before the exam one or something like that. So once you get to see the slides, it's gonna be custom made, it's gonna be like for everybody. So uh, for me, I'm, I am a, I'm not a native speaker, so I use a lot of picture to add um, so that you know American student can understand my enunciation better. So I help um, my student with, with pictures a lot. So I can personalize my slides a little bit, but every word um, that is shown on the slide has to be the same. Um, for the first time, you get to see that slides. And for, for some uh, teaching supervisor, they will give you, there sometimes they cut and paste um, <laughs> Uh, some um, some details that explain the slide uh, on the notes of the PowerPoint, which is really helpful. But if you are not clear from that note, you have to go back to the textbook and uh, try to explain to yourself first. So for me, my first time uh, seeing that slide, uh, what I did is I write my script. So at first I have to write the script, okay, I see this slide, so how can, how can I make sense of this slide? And then I write a script. And that, is, that can be for just the first year of teaching. After that, uh, once you get exposed to more slides, you will try to make sense on your head, and you can just uh, tr um, communicate right away on, in class. But your first time teaching is going to be a lot of preparation, a lot of trying to understand what your teaching supervisor trying to get at at this slide, and how can you um, linked one slide to another. I would just say that it's good to talk with your supervisor mm -hmm. and it's good to talk to other TAs who probably have already taught this course because they can give you lots of good information and lots of activities, to, they have lots of activities to share. Mm -hmm. Like in foreign language department, well languages department, we have a huge job box, some languages do where they're all activities for 101, 102, 203, 204, and all new coming TAs who are going to start teaching those courses have access to those, and they can appropriate to their own classes, to their um, ideal teaching, or to their per personality, how they see this particular material. So it's a lot about asking, not hesitating to ask people who are around you. Yeah, just to, to, um, to, um, to emphasize here that you've got a, a really good support system. Mm -hmm. You know, your teaching meetings are really helpful and your Dropbox is like the key. You can get access to all the videos and library access. So you are not gonna be alone in, in uh, being the TA at the VUVU for sure. Any other questions? Okay, uh, sh um, she asked about the control over the, the, the time, your like schedule. your schedule, often of office hours and everything. Um, yeah. um, it depends on your department and your class again. Um, so our intro class is in the bio department. It's, I, and I think most departments, they'll, they'll pick when you teach, but outside of that, oh, and when you have your, um, your teaching prep meetings, um, but outside of that, we ha we are allowed to pick whenever we want our office hours, as long as it's not like two o'clock in the morning. Um, and as far as assignments, again, that depends on the class too. The intro classes for the bio department, they give them these are what assignments we want you to be you to be giving. Um, some of the upper level classes. Um, Again, I pick my own office hours as long as they're reasonable. No one approves them or anything, but I'm not coming here at 2 o'clock in the morning, so I don't expect anyone, anyone else to. Although, if I don't want to do any extra work, that's probably a good way to avoid it. Um, but uh, in upper-level classes, I'll design all my own assignments. And just like I said before, you guys have all been students before, um, so you know what assignments look like. You know what works for you and what doesn't. So. Um, that's pretty straightforward too, just 
questions and answers or directed readings or anything like that. But as far as scheduling, mm -hmm. um, normally in my experience, it's just been they tell you when you're teaching and when the meetings are and everything else is up to you around your classes. Yeah, so you, you get to look at all the schedule in, your, in, in that semester that you have and then an hour or uh, hour and a half that you have left that is for the office hours. And you always put in the syllabus that um, um, you know, your, your certain uh, time, office hours, and then uh, all by appointment. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, it, to me, I find it's a lot easier to, to have the student go by appointment because, you know, um, we cannot, um, you know, uh, uh, serve everybody the time that you are available, but if you are available at, you know, four o'clock on Friday, which is really the time the student already left the campus, uh, you know, it's impossible for them. But if you have some like 20 minutes spare on your break, on your lunch break, you know, you, and if you think you can handle one issue of a student, you can schedule that. So I think we have a really um, a, a liberty to, to schedule our office hour as we please. Anything to add? Okay. Yeah, so I've set probably two office hours a week, depending on the class that I put on the syllabus and I'll go probably the first three or four weeks until I've decided no students are going to be coming to my office hours and then I just tell them if you need me send me an email and we'll work something out. Yeah, I'll, yeah. To, to add to that, I, um, office hour will be uh, just only used when the, the students start to learn that grade after the midterm. So yeah. because we send out the midterm grade, uh, if they get D's and F, they get the report and the letter sent to their address, their home address. So that is when they start to come to us. Have but a box of tissues in your office. Yeah, but uh, before or after than that, it's, um, we don't have a lot of students coming in. Yes. Um, teaching work? the lab or actually okay. doing research lab work? Which, what do you mean? Yeah, okay, so, um, so I've done two intro labs and a junior level lab, um, and the intro labs are, it's really straightforward. So we have meetings once a week, normally Wednesday night, where um, the lab manager says, I mean, she basically says, you guys are being the students tonight, this is what we're gonna do. And all the TAs go through what the experiments are and coming up with their own hypotheses and trying to pretend that we are undergrads. Um, she gives all the PowerPoints and all the handouts and um, answers any questions and then go home, go back over the PowerPoint once or twice change around things that I don't like, and then I'll, the next week you go in and do the same thing that she did for us, practically word for word. Um, in the junior level lab that I did, um, that was all ground up, so I did the entire lab, designed everything from scratch, so that was very, very differently. So I would see what the lecturer was doing in the lecture that week, and decide how I wanted the lab to coordinate with that, what it, I wanted to uh, uh, emphasize and what I wanted to hit on that they didn't have time in the lecture. And then I'd go spend some time by myself <laughs> dissecting whatever or running experiments or looking under the microscope and see how well it worked, um, see what difficulties the students might run into and then just be ready for that when they do it. So the intro labs are pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy. It's kind of fail-proof. Um, and you know, there's a lot of safety nets. And all of the biologists in the department have been through it. So everyone has experience and everyone can help. Um, but the upper level labs are a little more difficult. And you have, but you have a lot more freedom. Yes? <coughs> This is about as dressy as I get. <laughs> um, sometimes on the first day I might wear like a button-up shirt, but that doesn't last long. Once I start moving around and getting hot, that comes off. I wear whatever I want. 
no one's ever said anything, so <laughs> I guess it's okay. Um, for psychology department, <coughs> uh, I think it's, uh, it's set as a standard that people would address nicely, so because we are pseudo professor, because some of the some of your students will call you professor, even though you're not. So you, you have to act like you are a professor. So from, for us, uh, uh, business casual is the, the way to go because you have to make believe, because you have to speak right in front of the class and you know, give them, walk them through the slides and proctor the exam. So you are a teacher. You, know, you are the, uh, the first one that they came to. And so um, it's uh, really important to, to make them believe that you are a real professor. <laughs> well, with lo world languages, it might vary from this to this. <laughs> like it's somewhere in between, whichever you feel comfortable with, but be dressed nicely and neatly. Like you should be nice and neat. Like this is the way I'm, I go to class. I can wear jeans sometimes, but not a short top, of course, right? So just <laughs> nice jeans. So, but usually this is the way I dress for the class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, tone down from your, your interview weekend a little bit, not have to be that um, like suit or anything. But I think um, my, my, my friends, my colleagues did uh, dark jeans, dark pair of jeans with shirt. That is totally fine. Yeah. Yeah, and even in the bio department, so, I mean, use your brains. If you're working in a lab, wear closed toed shoes and pants. Um, undergrads, you are all undergrads, although you're grad students now, so you might be a little more experienced. Um, or you might have been more experienced back then, but undergrads are clumsy and drop things and spill things. And um, I probably shouldn't tell this story, but I had one student eat crude oil. Um, don't know why, um, but I mean, they, they do some crazy things. So especially in labs, dress covering and s dress for safety. Um, in, I've taught senior level, uh, senior level evolution lecture. Um, and my wife actually asked me, you still gonna dress like a slob? Um, so yeah, so I, <laughs> I dress, I, I just grab whatever's clean out of the laundry. I don't care what it is. But um, actually, like, uh, people ask me every once in a while why I, I dress like this. And it is somewhat intentional in a lot of classes because I come in, I'm loud and imposing, and I have a really dry sense of humor, and a lot of people don't get it. Um, so I can be a little in intimidating on the first day, and I think dressing more casually makes it a little a little easier and a little more relaxed for the students. Oh, okay. One thing to add is that uh, for, for those of you who, who come like fresh from grad, to, uh, from undergrad, and you feel like you want to, I think the way you dress kind of really it's, uh, set you apart from your students because you know you were last year undergrad. So uh, I think you know dress nicely can be the way to you know we are psychologists, so it's the way to to take you to the role of teaching, and I think that's probably helpful too. And you know for Asian face, you know Asian is pretty uh, tricky on. Like you know, <laughs> most of the students don't don't know uh, how old I am, and they thought that I am younger, but actually I'm you know 30 something up. So um, so I have to dress up a little bit so that they know that I am not one of them or something like that. Yeah, and I I'm glad actually really glad somebody asked about dressing because it's it can really play a big part. My wife looks like she's 18. Um, so if she's not dressed nice, they're going to treat her like a kid. Um, and some of the people you might be teaching might be 40, 50, 60 years old. They might be a significantly older than you. And um, dressing nice can be a way to make sure that you've kind of got a little bit more authority. It gives you a little bit more authority. For me, it's just standing in front of the room automatically gives me authority. But that's just kind of the presence that, that I have. My wife doesn't have that presence. So she dresses up every single day. Um, just because when you look 18 years old, it's just a little bit easier to get some more respect. Um, and that can be really complicated too. Gender plays a role. Um, we try to say it doesn't and we try to get around it, but it really can. Um, just the way you present yourself really can make a difference. So um, just kind of think about what kind of a person you are, what kind of 
how comfortable you're going to be in front of a group. And um, like I said, I'm not very comfortable, but I can fake it really well. So dressing casually works for me. My wife isn't comfortable. She looks very young, so she has to dress nice so that um, she gets the attention and the respect that you would hope a teacher should get. So just think about it a little bit and dress however you think is going to be best for you. And if it doesn't work, change. Yep. Other questions? Yes. Um, what are the benefits and drawbacks of teaching a large class versus a, like a smaller class? Hmm. To me, I, I, I find it as a challenge because every year I find myself growing a thicker skin, a stronger each year, you know, uh, confronting the student because my first year, you know, I all, uh, we always evaluating, you know, after class, well, this class is awful. I, I don't like myself today or something like that. So for me, teaching the big class, my most challenging thing is to lead the class discussion that will make everybody in the class, you know, 120 something students be you know attentive and enjoyable and not only just you know talk to only one student who you know always waste their hand so i think the most um rewarding thing about teaching the last class of uh, the last class is to overcome um the the the, the difficult tasks like leading discussion and you know trying to make all the whole class entertain and keep attentive to my lecture well, the biggest class I taught was 25 students because it's a language class, right? Mm -hmm. But my preferred size is probably for a language classroom is 12 students because it's easily to manage them. It's easily to give them some feedback. Um, like if it's a small class, there is nothing actually to talk about because we've learned everything about each other very quickly. So, yeah, but I think the challenge for a bigger classroom might be assessment point. Like how would you assess your their participation and you might think it before you start teaching that class. For example, my supervisor, uh, she teaches big classrooms and she gives sort of like she prints um, money and for each uh, discussion point, for each answer, she gives out this like slip of paper and people, it's not just a slip of paper, colorful one, but there is like a dollar or she teaches Russian classes so she prints out a ruble for example. and. Um, students write their name and the date on the back of that piece of paper and they just they uh, return those at the end of class and that's how she counts the participation points so it's pretty neat i think um it's bigger classes are definitely more challenging but one thing that i really like about big big classes and the bigger the better is because you'd be amazed how much random information some people have that others don't so I'm a scientist, so I do a lot of like problem solving type things and um, figure out the issues of the world and come up with brilliant ideas. And the more people you have, the more chances you're going to have that somebody's going to come up with something wild and outlandish. And it's really incredible sometimes. So um, one thing that I've asked my class is um, just as a like a warm up problem solving questions is, is like, how many steps would it take to walk from here to San Francisco? Um, just as like a quick warm up thing and just some of the creative ways that people come about, go about solving that kind of stuff is incredible. And when you have a big, big class, the ideas are all over the place and it really helps to show that there's a lot of different ways to, to answer different questions. Also, the, more, uh, the bigger the class is, the more diversity you tend to have. The more diverse background you have, the more ideas you have as well. Um, the biggest difficulty I think we hit on was, was, is assessment. So when you have a class this size or twice this size or three times this size of this room, um, it's really difficult. So you can grade tests all you want, but um, spot on assessment, making sure that the entire class understands something you just said is really difficult. So how I get around that is doing small group work and have, um, the groups either teach each other or also call out to me. So um, in a class this size, I'd probably say two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 12. Um, yeah, probably about 12 groups. And then all I have to deal with is 12 answers. And I just kind of assume that the group has taught each other and the group knows the answer <coughs> if one person is reporting back out. So there's, there's ways to get around everything. I really like big classes, but 
they, they can be difficult. Yeah, I think the, the big class is you get to see the diffusion of responsibility because you, yeah. they, they, you know, oh, there are 120 students, so there must be someone who raised their hand and talked uh, to the professor. So that is a lot of challenge. That is a big challenge that you have to come by. And, but you know, I, I had an opportunity to teach uh, the summer cl class, and it's only 15 students. And they know that you know, at some point, you know, I'm going to point and ask them what they think. So there are, they are a lot more uh, difference on how they prepare for class. You know, for, for a big class, the challenge is to get them to talk and get them to participate. Yeah, and this goes back to faking confidence. You can say anything, and 90% of the class, at least, will, will believe you right off the bat. So if I say, <laughs> if you haven't spoken already, make sure you say something, they don't know whether I remember or not. I don't, I don't remember anything. I don't learn names. I have a horrible memory. But if I say, if you haven't spoken already, I'm watching you, make sure you say something, most people get scared into, into saying something. One They'll trick, just yeah, one trick that I have is to uh, try to think, uh, try to make them think that you try to learn their names. Yeah. By you know, if you are in the discussion uh, time and you, you know, I, I don't know, I don't uh, usually use, you know, pick the names from the roster because the big class uh, student tends to skip it from time to time so you can call some name that is not there. So what I do is that I try to look for a student that is attentive enough uh, and you know I know that they are going to be a good example for class and then I point at them and I ask what's your name and then I start to and, and that is like one-on-one -on -one at first and start to ask them what do you think about this video and then you know and after that it was just the, the ice start to get cracking, and then more people will start raising their hand and talk. So there are tons of ways to, to work on that. Yeah. And again, you have other people in your department that have done it mm -hmm. lots before, so don't be afraid to go around and ask. Most people love talking about themselves. So <laughs> what ideas have you come up with to handle this? Yes. More questions? Yes. Do you have any tips for teaching online courses? Mm. Ooh. <laughs> Never even taken an online course, so oh, um, I'm out for that. <laughs> I am in a, um, I'm not uh, having a direct experience teaching online, but uh, we are uh, uh, the grad student who teach online also in my, in my teaching meeting as well. And uh, most of the problems that she come across has been the, uh, the way that how can you try to make them work and uh, submit their work on time? Because you know it's just like one-way mirror. You you know what they're doing because on your eCampus you can actually go and see uh, when and how long a student you know uh, you know look at one particular page. So you know if you assign a reading, you can you know, go back and see the report of how long it takes for them to to actually read and you know do some particular activities on the on the program. And you know, um, you have to probably let them know that you have those information in your hand so that they they don't really try to like sneak and not actually doing the work and try to be more um, giving more a, a lot of warning sign like you know you haven't done activity in the first half of the semester and this is your score and we are going to you try to project them have them realize that if you not start doing your work now, your grade is not going to be a good grade, something like that. Um, I'll say one more thing about online teaching. There are a lot of resources available at our website. If you look on page six of your handout, about halfway down, it's tlcommons.wvu.edu. A lot of resources on online teaching. Yes. Um, what advice do you have to um, balance teaching and your classes? Balancing. Oh. Okay, teaching. way to balancing teaching and your classes, your own classes, because you wear two hats, three hats, actually. Yep. Um, that's probably the most difficult thing as a graduate student. Um, teaching can take your entire life. You can put 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and still not get done everything you want to get done. You can put as much time as you want into that. So um, really, it's, it can be very difficult. So um, 
set goals for, for what you want to get through with your teaching. Um, set um, how you want to uh, how you want to accomplish those goals, and anything else is just frosting. Um, so make sure you're setting goals for your teaching. Make sure you know what you want to get want to accomplish, and everything else is just if you can get to it, fine. Otherwise, don't kill yourself. Um, if your students need need extra help, um, they can overwhelm your office sometimes. Um, sometimes you also need to be able to say, I'm busy right now, I have my own work I got to do. Um, come back in an hour or come back during office hours or um, learning center or talk to another TA if it's general questions or email me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, really difficult. So set goals for your teaching and stick to them. And anything else, just don't be upset if you don't get to it. Um, as far as your own classes, um, most graduate classes are designed knowing that you have time limits. So you're expected to do a lot on your own, so it makes it really easy for you to, as long as you're all right at scheduling things on your own, to prioritize for yourself. So take all the assignments that you have, take all the readings you have to do, and put them on your own, your own schedule. Just make sure that you're eating, getting sleep, all that stuff. Um, so most, yeah, most grad classes are designed knowing that you're teaching and doing research and driving and working and, um, and doing all the stuff that undergrads aren't. Um, I have a lot of trouble with undergrad classes as a graduate student. Um, when I take an undergrad class as a graduate student, that teacher doesn't know you're a graduate student and you're held to the same expectations that undergrads are. And I see a lot of the work is tedious and I don't need this, whereas in a graduate class, that's left up to you. In an undergrad class, you're expected to do everything. In a graduate class, that may not be the case. Um, it's up to you to learn what material you, you need to get out of it. So um, it's a lot of independence that you may or may not have had in undergrad. Um, and basically, any time management skills that worked in undergrad, try to just help them, <laughs> help nurture them over into a new atmosphere. But set goals and do your best to accomplish them. And if you can't, then push it off and do it next week. <laughs> um, one thing that I would like to point out is that you have undergraduate teaching assistant too for some of the classes. Some I'm not people, yeah, sure yeah. if you have all. But you know, you have teaching supervisor, you have your advisor on your research, and also you, you have an opportunity to supervise your undergraduate. So you know, I, I, I don't want to fully say that use them, but you have, um, you, 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 are, you have a, a power to give them some opportunity to learn some teaching experience. So, you know, if it's something really easy grading, like, you know, just, you know, looking at if they are, you know, making, you know, there are some, like, match activity, like, you know, you have activities and you just see if they give the right answer, you can give uh, your, your undergraduate teaching assistant to do those tedious, easy job, like, you know, um, capitalize, oh, sorry, alphabetize your, your activities before you put it on your grade book and stuff like that. So you have some help uh, with that. And for me, my own trick is that I, I am not leaving my own personal TV time. So um, sometimes when I have stack of grading to do, uh, I bring my, my uh, activities home and then I do the grading over the voice or you know some of those reality TV like Bachelorette or something that you can leave it on. Uh, mindless kind of TV show and you can do the grading um, when you're just you know having your time after your, your dinner break or something like that. So you don't have to set time. For me I, I try to um, you know m merge the leisure with, uh, with activities, with ac academic activity. If it's something that you don't need a lot of brain power to do you know, you can watch TV and grade. That's do with me. <laughs> well, my advice would be try to avoid being is an extreme perfectionist because this is yeah. what I am. I'm a perfectionist, but in grad school, it's really hard to combine yeah. studying and teaching and then personal life. So try to balance. So try to find time for accent or try to find time for spending time with your friends because it brings harmony in, a, in your life, right? And um, with teaching, it's setting goals for teaching, setting, setting goals for studying, and 
you're in grad school, I would say studying is, at least it's my priority, no matter how much I love teaching. And it happened in 2011 that I was so into teaching that but my classes at that time were so easy, so it just it went smoothly. But so just try to balance, try to find time for everything. Yeah, and we're told at least, I don't know if this is the standard, but typically 20 hours a, a week go to your teaching, 20 hours go to your own classes, and 20 hours go to re research. And sometimes you'll find that, that that 60 hours pushes up to 80 hours or 100 hours in a week. And sometimes you'll find that it's down to 20 or 40 hours in a week. Um, just don't get too used to those 20 hour weeks and don't let those 100 hour weeks kill you. Um, it's really difficult to find a balance, but um, you're all here because you've been able to in the past. So um, see what works for you and just schedule, schedule, schedule. Write down everything. I have post it's everywhere. Last question? One final question. Yeah, you can. You so like Martin Luther King Day or Labor Day, yeah, yeah. So that's mm -hmm. your day off too, um, depending on depending on what yeah. you're doing. So um, some of the science sciences, if you're working in a lab, you might doing research in a lab, you might need to take care of some lab lab work on that day. But otherwise, if the students are off, you're a student, so you're off too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yep. everyone. <laughs> Thank you.